Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles, and welcome back to another full card breakdown. This time for UFC Vegas, no, UFC 286. We have ourselves a pay-per-view in London, England. Edward versus Usman 3, and man, is this one a banger. Last week, we had ourselves a actually a pretty entertaining card and a super, super high drafting score card. I'm telling you guys, Marab is the DraftKings GOAT. I know we have some great scores this week, but Marab, you're not going to come close to him and his... Uh, his long-term success on DraftKings, but missed a little bit of gravely love last week. That's okay. Back to kill it here. UFC 286. And it's a big one for me in particular because it is Edwards versus Usman 3. I was fortunate enough to see Edwards versus Usman live in Salt Lake City, which was one of the most incredible experiences of my life because of how insane that fight was, how great the fight, uh, how great the fight card was as a whole, and just what a night such a, a moment in UFC history and they're running it back here and it should be a fun one. But we do have 15 fights. We do have a lot to cover. So I don't want to ramble on too long. I know the past videos have been a bit longer. I'm going to try to keep it shorter on this one, but 15 fights, man, 30 players to target on DraftKings. You know, I, I, I could take a little bit of time talking about them. So bear with me, grab some popcorn, settle down. Let's break down UFC 286. First fight of the night, 3-1 Juliana Miller versus the 6-4-1 Veronica Hardy. Hardy not being to the octagon since uh, 2020, I think, when she was. Veronica Macedo is no longer Macedo, now married into Hardy, and she's facing the ultimate fighter champion, Juliana Miller. And Miller's not someone I hold to a high regard technically. She's not someone I think is going to blow your mind away in, in terms of technicality, but she is a, how do I put this nicely? She's a psycho. And I mean that in the best way possible because everything she does is going out there to to kill you. I mean, she wants to go out there. She wants to beat you with pace. She wants to brutalize you. She's going to go nonstop action. And in doing so, she's going to try to wear down her opponents. She's not someone who is going to go out there style, get those standing highlight reel knockouts. She's going to want to take you down in the clinch, impose her will. And on the feet, although she's not throwing with any technicality, she's throwing heat. She's throwing in volume that usually breaks their opponents. And someone like Hardy who's coming in here after a few years off may succumb to that overall pressure like Juliana Miller. Do I think that Veronica Hardy is a world beater? No, but I think that she is a better submission grappler and a better technical striker. However, I don't think it matters in this spot here. The line may be wide in terms of skill, but in terms of styles, this is another one where I don't think Hardy's going to have anywhere to breathe. I don't think she has any room to move, and I think it's going to be Miller breaking her down the stretch. So I do think Miller's going to win this fight, but it's another one where I'm maybe looking to target violence. I always say first spread of the night, going to be usually a violent affair, and it has turned out pretty well. I might back it here. Minus 130 fight doesn't go. I, I love that line. I think I'll be playing it because I think it's either Juliana Miller going out there, balls to the wall, being that psycho that she is and finishing Hardy with her pace and pressure, or Miller being sloppy technically gets caught by an arm bar or something of Hardy that Hardy does do pretty, pretty well. Either way, I see it finishing. The pick is going to be Juliana Miller. Her nickname is Killer, and I think she does go out there and kill Veronica Hardy on DraftKings. This is honestly a decent fight to target because Miller's pace is going to go out there. She could score another 115 like she did against Walker. I do think she has good DraftKings upside at that higher range and could be a bit contrarian in doing so, whereas the win condition for Hardy is probably going to be catching her with something early on, and I don't think it happens at a high clip, but if she does go out there, she's a good punt play at 6.8. Next up, 19-4 and four, Ludovic Klein, 12-4 and four, Jai Herbert. Uh, Ludovic Klein was my like golden boy in terms of betting. I, I've been hammering his line. I've done pretty well betting him until... Last time, he burned me a bit with Mason Jones. He went out there, he, I don't know if it was a poor performance by Jones, Klein doing better, who knows, but uh, he's getting a, a, a weirder matchup here in Jai Herbert, the hometown boy, the uh, uh, the friend of Leon Edwards, someone that you think the UFC wants Herbert to win, but instead you have Klein as the favorite. Klein is the guy who's gonna be more dynamic, and I think this fight is pretty simply broken down to, I think Klein has more path to victory. I think Klein has more finishing potential with that ability to find the chin of Jai Herbert, which has been found many times before. We all know that the durability is a big concern for Jai Herbert. And additionally, Klein has that wrestling in BJJ in his back pocket that Herbert does not. Herbert can be taken down very easily. 55% takedown defense for someone like Jai Herbert. The paths are there for a little bit, Klein. I think he has methods to win this fight. It's just in a 15-minute kickboxing battle, I think that the range, the technicality, and the output of someone like Jai Herbert could win him optically in a 15-minute decision. Now, that is a certain situation. I want to reiterate, I think the rightful favorite here is Ludovic Klein because he does have more paths to victory. I'm just saying I, I would, I don't know how much involvement I want on Klein as a huge favorite because stylistically, we know he's okay to go out there and stand and bang. I don't know if that gives him the best opportunity to win this fight. I would like to see Klein go to his takedowns, 
uh, close the range, get into the clinch. In doing so, he could look like a hindsight favorite. It's just, I don't know how much of a financial involvement I want until I see that. Instead, maybe looking towards play the uh, the client finish only. Uh, Klein's been decently durable, and sure, he was finished in one of his UFC losses, but that was against a, a pace train land where that Herbert definitely is not. I think that more finish equity lands on the client side because Herbert's chin is deteriorating. I think that could be a way of looking at it. DraftKings wise, I'm not a big fan of Herbert on DraftKings. I mean, he put up 64 points in his last decision win, and I think that's kind of the path to victory for him in this spot. So not one I want too much involvement in. Klein could have some good upside being at a lower salary, having that wrestling in his back pocket, having that finish equity. But there are so many good plays in this on the slate, it's not one I'm running to go roster right away. Speaking of keeping things short, I can definitely keep this one short. Joanne Wood, 15 and eight. Luana Carolina, eight and three. Not a fight I want too much of a financial investment on, not a good DraftKings target. Sure, Luana Carolina could be a decent contrarian play at 7.6 because you have someone in Joanne Wood who, although she was facing the higher echelon of competition, hasn't looked good, has been deteriorating. To me, it's just a simple sit back and watch fight just to gauge where Joanne Wood is at this point of her career. I think Joanne Wood has the better level of competition, has more tools to get this done. However, if she shows that same poor takedown and submission defense that she has, Carolina could have that opportunity to, to hop on the back and, and cause some problems there. So again, pass fight, slight GBP upside to Carolina at such a dog price tag. Let's get to some fun ones here. 9 1 Jake Hadley, 14 and 6 Malcolm Gordon. Malcolm Gordon, we share the same name. We're both Gordons. Uh, we're both Canadian. Do we look the same? No. Do we uh, weigh the same? No, definitely not. And uh, do we have the same chin issues? Well, I hope not. I haven't really been sucker punched too often, especially off the ice, but that's really the, been the problem for Malcolm Gordon. Is he a guy who has durability issue? He doesn't have the best striking. To, to me and to many others, he is purely a jujitsu guy. A guy who can go out there, snap Dennis Bondar's arm, control Figueredo, but also succumb to these power punchers and be out wrestled, be out damaged, be out struck. And this is kind of a tough match for him here because Jake Hadley, 9-1, a, a guy who is a very, very good foundational technical striker and wrestler, a guy who's very, very well-rounded, has a lot of tools in many areas. He was a young fighter from the area they're looking to promote. I think this is a spot for Jake Hadley to go out there and get right. Sure, he's come off a nice performance against Candelario, but a lot of people remember him for dropping the ball against Nazi Mento. I think this is a get right spot for him to see where he is because I think Malcolm Gordon path to victory here is to finish Jake Hadley. And I'm not saying it's out of the question. It's just on the feet in the wrestling exchanges, Jake Hadley's going to have the advantage. This is a good violent bet in my opinion, but also a good drafting target because Malcolm Gordon's path to victory is a finish. We all know that he's a guy who likes to go out there and submit his opponents. I think that's the only way he's beating Hadley. I don't think he has decision equity or knockout equity. It's submission. So at 6.9K, there's some good volatility because he put up 102 when he pulled off that fluke submission against Bondar. You have to think that's his path to victory again. Other side of things, Malcolm Gordon's been finished in all six of his losses, 100% loss by finish rate, uh, however you want to say it. And I think that's another path to victory for Hadley. Hadley is expensive at 9.3, but I do think he scores well in a win. Another good high-end target there in Jake Hadley. So the pick is going to be Jake Hadley. I think he uses his striking to keep distance and piece up Gordon for range until finding that kill shot. He'll just have to mind his P's and Q's if there's any grappling involved. Next up, 7-0 Christian Duncan. Not Chris Duncan. There's another one coming up. Don't be fooled. Christian Leroy Duncan, 7-0. 12-3, Dusko to Dorovich. Dusko, um, heartbreaker to me. I mean, he, he beat Maki Batolo, my, my, my boy. Um, he let that right fo fight go over one and a half. This guy's just hard to read. I think he has power. I think he has decent technical ability on the feet, but he has no defense. This guy is all gas, no breaks. He has that tall man defense where he just goes like this and he can be clipped just like Punaheli Soriano did to him back in 2021. I think he has some wrestling upside in this spot where he did go out there, shoot two takedowns against Nojaquani, get that takedown and early submission against Patolo. I think he has that in his back pocket. But in this matchup, I think he's gonna be completely outstruck and out athleticismed if that's a way of putting it here, by Christian Leroy Duncan, who is, although he's making his debut, is a guy who's just been electrifying on the regional scene. Flying knees, insane knockouts. Duncan has that same athleticism and offensive prowess that Dusko has. He just has that additional defense and that additional durability that I don't think Todorovic has here. So I think the guy who's going to be he's stronger in the clinch exchanges, the guy who's going to have more output coming from different angles on the feet, and the guy who's going to win more optics as well as have more durability is going to be Christian Leroy Duncan. 
I'm not saying it's out of the equation for Dusko to have a more patient game and utilize his, his powerful shots from the outside. I'm just saying it's not a likely outcome. I do think Christian Leroy Duncan wins this fight at a very high clip and he is a decent mid-range option here on DraftKings due to that finish ability he has over Dusko in this spot. This next one's a fun one too. Leroy Murphy, 11-0-1. Gabriel Santos making his debut, 10-0. And like I said, debut short notice. That seems to be the question here because I think Gabriel Santos doing his tape really impressed me. I think he's a guy who has very good foundational skills and has a good ability to mix it up wherever it goes. But it's coming down to short notice. Facing the hometown guy, Leroy Murphy, who we've seen fight against adversity, have wins in the UFC, have very good success, and being a guy who's never lost inside the octagon, that's a very, very tall task for your debut. I think that Gabriel Santos has a decent future here. I think he has the grappling upside here because I do think Leroy Murphy can be taken down, can be controlled, but he's gonna have to watch out. because I think on the feet, Leroy Murphy's gonna be the more dynamic striker. I think he's gonna be the guy who's gonna have the ability to win minutes as well optically on the feet. And of course you can throw in the whole hometown judging thing there as well. I, I think the more dangerous guy on the feet is gonna be Murphy. And I think he has a decent enough scrambles to avoid that takedown upside of Gabriel Santos. If we add in the, probably the cardio advantage I think Murphy has here as well, I think he is the rightful favorite. But being at this fight is so close in salary at 8.3 and 7.9, it is a fight I'm looking to target. I do think Murphy wins a, a good chunk of the time. For that reason, I kind of leaning towards him at 8.3. I don't know if he gets Santos out of there, so he's not maybe the best target, especially considering that Klein, O'Neal, and Morales are around him. But I think Santos at 7.9 is probably a better GPP play. I know I picked Murphy to win this fight, but the, but the path to victory for Santos is takedowns and control time, something that's going to score very well. At 7.9, he is a very, very good contrarian and GPP play, although I am picking Leroy Murphy to win. Moving on up, Muhammad Makayev, 8 0, 14 2, Jafel Filo. And Makayev is set up for success once again, 9.7. The guy averages 122 across his three UFC wins so far, scoring a Above 119 in all three of them. This kid is the goods. He has a very, very good wrestling foundation. He has decent striking on the feet as well. And he's got a good finishing game. And against a guy in Philo who is making his UFC debut, I think Philo makes too many foundational errors. I think Philo puts his head in some precarious situations. And I think that he is just overall slower to all these wrestling exchanges that I think Makai is going to have the edge in. Yes, this line is super wide. It's hard to play it, but I do think it's warranted. I think Makai. I think Makayev could look hindsight minus a thousand in the spot with his takedown upside finish ability and the ability to just stifle that offense Philo has. I think Philo is a, a good hammer, not the best nail. And I think we're going to find that out here on Saturday. 9.7 for Makayev. He's like Bautista last week. He should win. He should score very well. But considering all the people around him, can he make the optimal lineup? It's hard because there are so many good scorers this week. It, it's tough to get to someone like Muhammad Makayev. Although I'll be trying my best to. He's a good cash play. And if you have a satellite for him, He's definitely gonna go out there and score around that 115, 120 mark like he's been doing all along. Next up, 10, one and one, Sam Patterson, six and oh, Yanel, Ashmoff. And Sam Patterson is a guy I am going to be fading eventually. Let's put that out there. He's not very impressive to me. He's not the best minute winner. He's not the best defensive wrestler. He's not the best, he's not the best optically. But what this guy is, is he is a huge dude for this weight division. He's 6'3". He's going to have a 6-inch height advantage here in the spot against Yanal. And, and although I don't think he's going to do too good against the higher echelon of the division, I don't think he should be hyped up as much as he, he is, is Ashmos the guy to really expose that? Because sure, Patterson has good foundations. He has some good technical striking. He has a very, very good offensive jiu-jitsu game with a very good guillotine. And that range is going to be hard to get around for anybody. At 6-0, we haven't seen that much from Osmos. We haven't seen enough that tells us that he's going to go out there and stifle that offense of Patterson. But what we have seen from the style of Hinal you know, Osmos is a guy who can go out there and grind you and look to wrestle you, push up against the cage, win minutes. And I think that he could be the minute winner in this spot. Yes, if this was 50-50, of course, I would hammer Sam Patterson because he has that range. He has that finish ability in the spot. But should this line be that wide? Is there not a path to victory where Oshmos goes out there, pushes him against the cage, grinds out Patterson, makes his a dirty, sloppy fight, and doesn't let him get off in his game? Probably. I think, you know, Oshmos has the wrestling, the clinch control, and the top pressure to cause problems for Sam Patterson. And I think this line is very wide. On DraftKings, it's a fight to target for sure, because Yasmos at 7.2 has a, a higher path to victory than I think the line indicates. He has that clinch control. And I think that that decision style of fight will score pretty well. 90, 100 at 7.2, that could be optimal. Other side of things, if Ashmos can't get that going, if Patterson's able to keep at the end of his punches, not only does Patterson have decent power, but he also has a very good guillotine, good submission game. He could have a finish potential as well at 9K. 
a fight I want to target as a whole, but I am leaning towards some dog ownership in Yanal Osmos. Time for the second Chris Duncan now. Chris Duncan, not Christian, Chris Duncan is 9-1, Omar Morales 11-3, and, and my first thought when I finished my tape was if Omar Morales doesn't get starched by Euros Medic last time, he's minus 300 in this fight. And I think the main reason why he's not is because people think he has this deficiency, this, this chin deficiency, and he can't take, he can't absorb damage. And against a guy like Chris Duncan, that is something to be wary about, because I think Chris Duncan is all gas, no brakes. All he has is just bombs in his hands. Not the best defensive wrestler, not the best defensive anything, because he can get hit by anything. Not the best durability, not the best cardio, but he has pistons. And that burned us when we bet Campbell, because Campbell was almost put his lights out a few times until Duncan found that come back, knockout win. But in the spot here, I think Omar Morales is not only gonna have more finish equity, but I think he's the better technical striker to knock out Chris Duncan, like Chris Duncan's almost been knocked out before. And I think that he also has some offensive wrestling in his back pocket that could stifle the offense of Chris Duncan until Chris Duncan tires out. Because like I said, not very good durability, not very good cardio, not very good defense. I think Omar Morales, Omar Morales has way more paths to victory in this spot and should be a much heavier favorite. With that being said, is there a world where Chris Duncan knocks out Omar, Omar Morales? Yeah, that's a pretty high possibility. I mean, Omar Morales has been knocked out before. That's packed a victory for Duncan. If you're worried about that, play him on DraftKings. But should it be 50% implied because it was minus 110, minus 110? Probably not. I think Omar Morales should be a heavier favorite here. I played him on the money line already. I'll be playing him on DraftKings. I do think it goes out there and finishes Chris Duncan. If you're worried of that durability of Omar Morales, that's fine. Play the under. I think this fight ends one way or the other. I think it's a great fight to target on DraftKings, a very, very volatile matchup, and I'm looking forward to it very much. The prediction will be Omar Morales, but I'll have both sides on DraftKings. And the headlining prelim is Jack Shore, 16-1. So sad to say that undefeated record is gone. Versus Mac Warner Americani, 17-8. Uh, Jack Shore, I love the guy. I bet on him in all his fights in front of the UFC. Yes, it burned me against Ricky Simone. I'm completely aware of that. Ricky Simone looked great, and there's no taking that away from him. But he's getting a step down, and that, and that price tag kind of reflects it. Jack Shore is a moving up a weight class, and he's still minus 500 here because he's facing a guy that is round one submission or bust. We've seen that over and over again where Mac One Americani steps in the cage. He's going to go balls to the wall in the first round. If he can't get it, he will die. Murphy went out there, completely sold for that first round submission, and got knocked out in the second round. Pierce went all out first round, got overwhelmed by the pace and pressure, finished in that second round. Gamoella Kirk just dominate him for the last two rounds, won a decision against him. Nakamura Americani is not a long distance runner. He is a sprinter. He's a guy who likes to go out there, balls the ball first round, and sometimes it works. He submitted Mike Grundy in that first round, submitted Henry in that first round. Nakamura Americani is a fantastic submission grappler when he has energy. The problem is Jack Shore is very good foundationally. He's one of the most well-rounded fighters we've seen. And we know he has cardio. We also know that he has incredible fight IQ. I am a huge fan of Jack Shore and his fight IQ. And I think he's able to implement it here. Sure, Mach 1 is going to be dangerous round one. That's kind of why you want some exposure to him at 6.7k on DraftKings because his path to victory score is 110, 120 with a first round finish. But if he can't get that first round finish, Jack Shore is going to live up to his price tag. He's going to wear him down the stretch. He's going to be winning all the striking exchanges. And he's going to have the takedown defense to really stifle that offense that Mach 1 has. With the pace, with the pressure, with the output, Jack Shore should beat him. I think I think he gets him out of there second or third round. The violent props aren't bad on this one because we all know Mach 1 Americani can't really do much after that first round. And I think this is one that Jack Shore gets him back on the horse. Line is wide, I get it. But another fight where I'm leaning towards betting violence. And I do think Jack Shore gets back on track here. On to the main card, Marvin Vittori, 18-5-1. Roman Delice, 12-1. Um, Delice has burned me a few times. Apparently he's good. Sure. But everything I've seen from Roman Delice has shown me that he is an opportunistic finisher. He is a Ryan Spann, a guy who doesn't go out there and win too many minutes. He just wants that finish. And sure, he's able to get it. He looked great in getting that finish against Hermanson. He looked great against that finish against Kevin, Kevin Hayes. That's a hockey player against Phil Haas. But what happens when you face a guy with a brick for a head? Marvin Torrey is invincible. We've seen that. And when Roman Delete say can't get him out of there, what happens? Well, Vittori will probably coast to a decision, winning those minutes, winning those clinch exchanges, staying safe. More dangerous fighter is Roman Delete say. And that's why I'm gonna have some ownership of him at 7.1 because he has finished equity in the spot. But I don't think he's a better minute winner than Vittori. I think this is also a huge step up for someone in Roman Delete say. It's a good time for us to, to gauge how it's gonna be. I don't have too much ownership of Vittori because I don't think he scores that well in a win. I think it is a decision win. Or maybe a third round finish if he puts on a huge amount of pace and pressure on Roman Delice. But he will have to be careful. Delice is dangerous. I do think he has more finish equity. But the most likely outcome to me is Marvin Vittori getting his hand raised due to his pace, his pressure, and minute winning ability.
Another one of my favorite fighters, 9-0 Casey O'Neill, 29-1 Jennifer Maya. Just like Jack Shore, I bet on Casey O'Neill every single one of her fights, and she has not done me wrong yet. She's done great. However, not only is she getting a step up in competition, she's coming off an ACL reconstruction. That's not that's, that's never a good look. Uh, I don't think it's too wise to go in three, four units deep on her. But I think she has a style to cause problem for Maya. I think she has good pace, pressure, foundations. And I think she's able to take down Maya, stifle that BJJ that Maya has, and score pretty well on DraftKings in the process. Casey O'Neill is one of the best DraftKings scorer up there with Marab because in four fights, she averages 125 points. I mean, she's a very, very talented DraftKings player. Uh, she has very good offensive output, very good pace, very good takedowns, ground and pound, always looking for that finish. Her, sure, her strike might be a bit green, and I don't think it's too wise to be striking for Jennifer Maya with all this time, but I do think she's able to go out there, get the get the win, and look good doing so. Jennifer Maya on DraftKings not too appealing. I know I said I, I wanted to sit back and, and see how that reconstruction looks on Neil, see how she's able to come back after a little bit of a layoff and, and see if she's making those improvements. I think she has made them. I think she scores well on DraftKings. But because of that DraftKings ownership, I don't know if I want a money line bet on her, although I do think she gets it done. Next up, Gunnar Nelson, 18-5-1 versus the 18-9 Brian Barbarena. Um, this seems mean. This seems cruel. Uh, Brian Barbarena's biggest hole in his game is his ground game, and Gunnar Nelson is a wrestler. Uh, Gunnar Nelson's a guy who's going to take him down, take the back, look to finish Barbarena the same way RDA did. I don't like it. It, it, it seems like a setup fight for Nelson, looking to get him back on track. Whoever Nelson's manager is going from Sato to Barbarena, that's, you're doing a great job getting him these wins. I think that price tag is justified. I think that a 9.2K, Gunnar Nelson's a very good cash play and even GPP play because his path of victory is takedowns and finishes, which I think he gets pretty easily. I love Brian Barbarena, but this is not an easy fight for him. Give me Gunnar Nelson. Co-main event, 23 and four, Justin Gaethje, 12 and one, Rafael Fazeev. Super fun fight. And I think it comes down to the volume of Gaethje versus the power and technicality of Fazeev. Sure, Fazeev faded down the stretch game with Green, who had a similar volume style to Gaethje, but Fazeev was still going out there, putting on output insanely powerful strikes. He's shown that he's working on his cardio at five rounds or almost five rounds with RDA, sorry. I like Fazeev in the spot. Line might be a little wide. I, I missed that when it was minus 110, minus 110. I almost bet it. I thought I did my research. I came out the outcome that I do think Fazeev wins this fight. Sure, there's a world where Gaethje goes out there, out volumes, out pressures him and wins a fight, but I don't think that's too often. I think if we also take in that Oliveira rocked Gaethje, I think Fazeev hits harder than Oliveira. Is that shin deteriorating of Gaethje? Is there durability concerns? Probably not. I do think this is a fight that probably goes all 15 minutes. In those 15 minutes, I can count on Fazeev's technicality and power to sway the judges for two or three rounds. I think it gets it done, but it will be dice in that third round. I actually don't want any involvement on this fight. Not from DraftKings or betting. Uh, I think on DraftKings, if it goes all 15 minutes, if these guys are as durable as I think they are, if it is a very, very fun 15 minute striking affair, it's not gonna score the best, especially considering the people around them. And on the money line, I kinda just wanna enjoy this fight from a fan, as a fan perspective, and I did miss out on the line of Fazeev, so pass. And uh, I wish everybody the best of luck. I'll be cheering for Fazeev, I, I do think he wins. However, uh, just gonna sit back and enjoy. And last but not least, Leon Edwards, 20 and three, Kamara Usman, 20 and two, redemption for Kamara Usman after what was one of the greatest comebacks of all time. Uh, one of the greatest storylines in UFC history. Um, I talk about it all the time, the fact that I was lucky enough to be there, but it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I mean, let's not forget that Usman was going coasting to a decision win there. He was minus 10,000, I think, uh, at, that, at the end of the fourth. Fans were leaving. Uh, people literally right beside uh, my dad and I at that fight got up and left. And I think that puts into perspective how much Usman was dominating. And although Leon Edwards went out there, landed that high kick, got that knockout win, he wasn't winning. And he didn't look good in rounds two, three, four. He was getting dominated. That's a fight I, that's a fight I bet on Leon Edwards. And that's a fight I had him on DraftKings. But let's not forget that even in a loss, Kamara Usman put up 98 points. I think Usman is a rightful favorite, and I'll and I'll put it that way because as the champ, Edwards now has this expectation. He's no longer got that huge underdog story. He's more so he's there defending the belt. Usman is is hungry. He's going in there for another win. He had it in the palm of his hand, and it he he lost it. I understand the narrative that Usman is getting older, his knees are weak, but that didn't show last time. There in person, you saw Usman dominate Edwards in rounds two, three, four, and in round five, really. And although it was spectacular, 
is it a fluke? I don't want to call it a fluke. I don't want to take anything away from Edwards, but there is a world where you have another ref and the ref doesn't pull him off the cage. And that never happens. And Usman is still champ. All of this to say is I think Usman wins this fight. I think he, he showed that he is the stronger of the two with the better style in here with his, with his cage pressure, his takedowns, his top control. I think that from range, Edwards is deadly. Pound for pound, headshot, dead deadly, the way that he showed last time. But I'll tell you this for a fact, if, if Usman gets down to minus 200, I will play him. I, I think he should be favored in this spot. I think he is the rightful favorite. Um, but all betting line aside, drafting is why this is a fight you want to target. Like I said, Usman put up 98 points last time in a loss. If he won that fight, he was going to put up almost 130. I think that people are loving Edwards this week, and I get him as an underdog price tag. I'll probably have some ownership of him too. But at 8.9, I do think that that win for Edwards shifts a bit of the ownership over to him. I think it allows Usman to be that a tad bit under-owned here, and I think that I will be taking advantage of it. I will have a lot of Usman this week. I do think it goes out there, reclaims his belt, even though I will admit I am cheering for Leon Edwards. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I broke down 15 fights. I know I spoke too much. A lot of, a lot of talking recently the past three weeks, longer videos, but a card like this, you kind of have to do it. Before I leave, though, let me leave you guys with my quick picks. Uh, I'm taking Juliana Miller in the first one. We are taking Ludovic Klein. I might actually take Luana Carolina in this next one. But I do think Joanne Wood's father better level competition. Give me Joanne Wood. Jake Hadley, Christian Leroy Duncan, Leroy Murphy, Mohamed Makayev, Sam Patterson, although I think it's close. Omar Morales, Jack Shore, Marvin Vittori, Casey O'Neill, Gunnar Nelson, Rafael Fazeev, and Kamaro Usman. On DraftKings, I'm targeting that main event. I'm targeting that Duncan versus Morales fight. Casey O'Neill and Makayev are great DraftKings scorers. I think Ashmov is a very, very live dog, but I will have some ownership of that uh, Patterson fight as a whole. And finally, both that Hardy Miller and Gordon Hadley fights are decent fights to target as a whole as well. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. If you have any questions, feel free to comment them down below or DM me on Twitter at GamblesGordo. We'll be posting my bets this weekend, probably Friday night, considering this card is so early. So I wish everybody the best of luck. I hope everybody enjoys the card. And let's make some money, guys.